this webinar. So once again, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on regular subsim interaction. My name is Brandon Gaynor, and I'm currently the Acting Director of Professional Development with CBC OEI at One. And I'm pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitator, Deanna Gossett. To give you a little bit of background about Deanna, she is a tenured business and real estate professor at West Los Angeles College, where she's also the DE coordinator. She also has some experience teaching at a Bay Area College at Foothill College currently, I believe also in the business department. Is that correct, Deanna? Uh, I no, I teach in the graphic and ah, interactive design, graphic and exercising interactive. my creative side. Ah, so again, multi-talented. Deanna also has a background, a BA in math and economics from Columbia College and an MBA from the Columbia School of Business. So as you can see, she is multi-talented. Now, during this webinar, we'll also be linking to a survey for you all to provide feedback. We'll be dropping that link in the chat at about 30 minutes and periodically after that, as well as at the end of the webinar. Now, we ask that you fill this out to let us know how we're doing with this webinar so we can create programming that's really more tailored to the needs of the system moving forward. Lastly, while At One does offer badges as proof of completion for our courses, we don't provide a badge for attending this webinar, but if your institution does require proof of attendance or for flex credit or professional advancement, please remain until the end of the webinar, complete the survey, and request a copy of the responses to be sent through the Google form. You should be able to use that as proof of your attendance. Now. I've already talked way more than I should, so I'm going to turn it over to Diana, who will get us started. Thank you, Brandon. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you. So my name is Diana Gossett, as Brandon um, indicated, and I am at currently West Los Angeles College as the distance learning coordinator. I'm also a tenured professor. Um, I teach real estate and business, as he mentioned. But one of the best parts of my job is teaching online. And I was one of the early adopters. I started teaching in 2008 at Los Angeles City College. And I started teaching online in 2012, 2013. And I like to call that the wild, wild west, when anything went. <laughs> and so... I really like professional development around um, online classes because I have been every user. I've been a complete novice. I don't know how to do anything. We're brand new. I'm sort of intermediate. I got my classes. I'm doing lots of stuff wrong to all the way up until, you know, I'm an expert of sorts. Some say sometimes, <laughs> um, but we're all students, right? So we're, we're, we're continuously learning. If you all would do me a favor and put your name and school in the chat. And also one of the things I always like to ask my students, if you have a burning question that you absolutely need to have answered before we're done with our time here, please put it in the chat so that I can make sure I've covered every single solitary thing that you need to know. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Go ahead and let's try the desktop. Uh, da, da, da. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So, okay, well, let's get the slides up. So, I do have a presentation for you today, and then I'm going to spend some time taking you around my class. Um, I teach at West LA. And one of the nice things about teaching is that you're able to not only take theory and, uh, but also put it in practice. And so I have a class that I'm going to share with you guys, some of the things that I've used that we're going to learn today. Um, it is a poker approved course for those of you who are, oops, sorry. Oh no, I did not mean to do that. Those of you who are aware of the poker, the peer online course review process, this course has gone through that process. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about regular substantive interaction or RSI as it's known in online courses. And when I was a kid, I was a curious kid. My favorite thing to do was learn. 
And it really worked out well for me because my mother was a teacher. <laughs> so um, she used to teach me basically with the scientific method. So if you can imagine, like put, put, put your imagination hats on, if you can imagine like a three or four year old and all the questions that they have, my mother literally would go through the who, what, where, when, why, how of every single question. It was like, oh, mom, wh why are there, why are there, uh, you know, clouds in the skies? And she would talk about condensation. She would make maps. I would say, why do we have light reflection? She build me prisms, and like it literally was this way that I began to love learning, and I take that with me um, in my classes. I take it with me in my work. I'm, I'm ever so uh, still a student of life. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the who, why, what, who, what, where, when, why, and how of RSI. And we're going to do that so that you can have a really, really clear idea of what it is, why you need it, how it's going to help your students. And then we're going to go through some use cases where I look at how that can repre be represented in practice in an online course. Okay, so let's get started. Let's get started with the who. So the who is who does RSI, regular substantive interaction, apply to, right? So we have this idea of correspondent education and distance education. So when we talk about online courses, online courses can both be correspondent and distance education. And in fact, I am a real estate uh, broker. And one of the things that I have to do every four years is correspondence education. And they literally mail me some books, or at least they used to. Now everything is online. But they would mail you some books, and you would go online, take the test. You'd read the books, take the test, and you'd get your little CUE certificate. There was no professor, no one to ask questions, no one to sort of help me figure all that out. And so we want to make sure we're not that. In distance education, we want to make sure we're interactive, that we're guiding our students, that we're making sure, you know, we're answering their questions, that we're building and scaffolding the knowledge that we're sharing with them, right? We don't want it to just be something that you set and forget. So RSI is for online courses, distance education courses, and it also is for instructors and students. You know, it's this idea that there's a community and there's a, we have an obligation to our students to make sure we are teaching them in the same way that we would teach them in an in-person classroom. There are very few of us who would go into a classroom and talk to our teachers, talk to our students, talk, 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 and see a bunch of blank faces and just continue to talk, right? If we saw blank, blank faces, we'd, we'd ask questions, we'd maybe give them some examples, maybe we'd show a video. We try and find different ways to engage them. We would maybe have them do some group work so that they could share their knowledge with each other, right? We just wouldn't push the play button and keep going through our slides without checking for understanding, right? So we kind of want to mimic the same thing in our online courses. Um, and the other port, important part is amongst students, if applicable. And this part is really, really important because one of the things that I like to tell my students, especially my web design students and graphic design students, is that your learning cannot end in the classroom. You have to know how to teach yourself, how to learn from other coworkers, colleagues, right? And so this idea of building a community around learning is going to be super, super important. So when we think about RSI, we wanna make sure we're understanding it's for online courses, it's for our students and instructors um, and students between themselves. So now this is the big fun question, what, what is it? And RSI is, stands for regular substantive interaction. And basically in a nutshell, it's instructor initiated, regularly scheduled, predictable, substantial contact communication that is focused on the course subject. So we wanna make sure it's regular, it's ongoing. And, and the idea again is we wanna make sure that we're not just giving them information. 
one of the things that I do as a distance coordinator, because I have so many different hats that I wear, is I make sure my course is fully set up for the semester at the beginning of the semester, all 16 weeks, all 18 weeks, all the announcements, all the assignments, all of the, you know, all of the lectures, all the PowerPoints, all of the anything that needs to happen. And the reason I do that is so that I can make sure I have time to spend with my students, answering their questions, making sure they're learning, um, making sure I have the ability to revise assignments if I need to, making sure I'm sending them announcements, making sure we're all on the same page. And so with this idea of regular, you want to make it predictable. And in my classes, I set them up in a way where they know every week they're going to get a module. And in that module, they're going to have things that they're going to need to read, but they're also going to have discussions. They're going to have assignments. They're going to get feedback from me in a specific week. They're going to get announcements two to three times a week. They know every week that it is very, very much the same and it's predicted, predictable. The second part of, of RSI is this substantive interaction. So yes, they know that they're going to hear from me in my announcements. Yes, they know they're gonna get their feedback from me on their assignments within a week. Yes, they know that you know they have to uh, communicate or reply to their classmates and classmates discussions um, within the week. They know all of that. But the substantive interaction is how I am ensuring that their learning is happening. And this is really, really the key in component, right? So I am giving them assignments, but is the feedback that I'm giving them helping them to um, scaffold their learning, right? And so when we talk about substantive interaction, we wanna make sure that it's interaction that's relevant and contributes to learning and comprehension of course content. So when we have feedback for assignments, we wanna make sure we're telling them the areas that they did really, really well. Um, or areas that they really, really miss. And we can use things like rubrics and we'll talk about some of the ways that we can make sure the feedback is really, really helpful. Um, answering emails in a reasonable time. And I like to suggest 24 to 48 hours. I always do tell my students that I don't work on the weekends. Um, that's reasonable, we have to have a life. But I think 24 to 48 hours between nine to five work hours is reasonable. I cannot tell you how many times I cringe when I'm sharing the screen of an instructor trying to help them out and I see 778 inbox messages. That is 778 students that have not been answered, right? And so our job is to make sure that we are partners. You know, we're, we're, we're not the sage on the stage, but we're the actual guiders through their educational process. So that's what I really love about this RSI is that it takes the learning process and really codifies what we should be doing anyway. So I'm so excited about it. The second question or the third question is where, where? And I, I remember asking my mom, I'd be like, so, so where do the, the clouds go? at night when, when we can't see them anymore, right? So when we talk about RSI and where, it's gonna be online courses, right? But what does that mean? That means any asynchronous course, any remote synchronous course, I think a lot of times um, people will, you know, think that remote synchronous doesn't necessarily fall in on online and it does. Um, any hybrid course or any high flex course. So, even though we mostly focus RSI on asynchronous courses, we wanna take these practices to any component of distance education. And all of these components are part of distance education. So it's really, really important that you kind of keep that in mind. Even though I'm having uh, RSI in my remote synchronous class, what would that look like? You know, regular announcements, me sending, I, I can't even tell you how many in the distance learning office, one of the, the nice parts is that we get to see the students who are lost and confused and have complaints, right? And so I can't tell you how many remote sync classes we have students calling and they're like, oh, the semester started on Monday and I have no idea where my class is gonna be or what the Zoom is or what you know the information is. 
Um, and they're just so lost and confused. School started today. I have no information. So you want to be providing this regular I, information to students. Your Zoom information is here. Your office hours are here. You know, this is a book that you can have. Making sure you're sending out an uh, introduction letters a week before the class starts. Those type of things. Even if it's a remote sync, even if it's a hybrid class, you think, oh, well, it's hybrid. I'm going to see them in, in, in the classroom. But there's still a component of those hours that are required to be online. And whatever that component that's required to be online, if it's 50%, you still have to meet that regular interaction, that substantive interaction in the online component, even though you're doing that stuff in the classroom too. So I really wanna make sure that we hit that note really uh, importantly. And there are some institutions that are doing high flex, which is really, really um, groundbreaking. And it can be a lot more challenging to come up with different strategies uh, for blending dual delivery modes. But you still wanna make sure for those students who are in the online portion that you are providing RSI. All right, so we went through the who, the what, the where, now it's going to be the when. So we talk about this idea of regular <laughs> scheduled, um, and I had, we have flex week, flex, uh, flex day every year. And I ran into a, an instructor who I hadn't seen in a while and we were chatting and we were talking about discussions and it, we we're talking about an online course, a 16 week course, and they said to me, yeah, I have discussions. I have about three of them. I almost had a heart attack. Three discussions for a 16 week class is not considered regular. So we wanna make sure we give you some guidelines about what regular uh, interaction is. Um, first of all, it's going to be initiated on by the instructor on a timely basis and a regular basis. So if you're doing discussions, they should be weekly. In a 16 week course, if it had to be every other week, that would be acceptable. It's still regular, it's still predictable, but three or four discussions in a week does not meet RSI. Um, they should be something that, you know, if, if it's a shorter course, so let's say you have an eight week course at West LA, we have different formats. We don't just have a whole semester. We have eight week courses, we have five week courses, we have 15 week courses. Um, and so in a short week course, regular might be two to three times a week. So you're sending announcements two to three times a week. You're having discussions two to three times a week, right? So you want to make sure that the regular intervals match the length of the course, okay? Um, the last part of regular interaction is, like I said, making sure you're responding to students in a timely fashion. One of the things that really, really, I have a heart for our students is when they call and they're like, I, I, I'm taking my final and, you know, I, I only have five minutes and left and, you know, I can't do something and my instructor is not available. I've been emailing her all week and she hasn't given me any answers. So I'm basically now, you know, fighting against the clock to get this assignment or quiz in. Um, and so we don't wanna be that instructor. We wanna make sure that we're answering questions for our students, that we're getting them the information that they need. Um, and there are a lot of different ways we'll talk, we can do this and we'll talk about it. One of my favorite ways is the class lounge. I recently had a um, my review at Foothill. And my dean said to me, shout out to all my Foothill instructors, if there are any here. He said, you know, I've seen online classes that have class lounges before, but I've actually never seen people participate so much in them. I think I had like 60 or 70 posts in my class lounge. And he was like, how do you do that? Um, and so I was like, well, one of the things that I do is I give extra credit for my, my class lounges up to 10 points right, which could be a lot depending on how many points are in the class. But, you know, the idea is I'm not up at 11 o'clock on Sunday night when you're doing your homework. I'm just not. Um, but your classmates are, right? So if you're having a question about where to find the answer for question two in module five, put it in the class lounge. I'm pretty sure one of your, your, your classmates can help you. And also you can earn extra credit because the idea of learning from one another in each other is, is important. Um, but getting back to, you know, 
promptly and proactively, we want to make sure that we're responding to the students. So I kind of give them that guideline within 24 to 48 hours. If it's not 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday, you can go to the class rounds, but otherwise you can depend that I'm going to get back to you in a timely fashion. Next is why, RSI why, why do we even care? That was my biggest question, why, why mommy? Why is this, why do we have rainbows? Why is the sky blue? And bless her heart, my mom just loves teaching. So she would entertain all of my questions, but you know, and, and my granddaughter, I have a granddaughter now and she's the same way. And I keep telling her mom, like you just need to throw all of the information at her and she will, you know, either stop asking questions or become really brilliant, either or. Um, <laughs> Either way, it's a win-win, right? So why? Why do we want to do RSI? Why do we care? Why is it important? Well, the first thing is that it complies with federal and state regulations. So I'm going to get into the actual nuts and bolts of RSI in a moment. But what's important to know is that it is legally requirement. So in 2021, the Department of Education changed Title V, and they mandated that RSI is the standard for online courses. So this is an optional, it's not suggested, it's not guidelines, it's not, you know, this is what we should be doing for the betterment of the student. And mind you, we should be doing all those things, right? Like we should make sure we're doing the best for our students. We should be doing, creating great classes for our students anyway. But when you add that extra, you know, I, I always tell my students in my business classes, when you're talking about ethics, you have like legal what's legally required and then you have like what you should do so we should be doing those things ethically as instructors but legally we're required to make sure we're doing um, at least two out of the five of these things and we'll go over that in a moment I'll give you more detail of what that looks like but I want you to kind of imprint that on your mind that this is required you must you must um, it helps our students so I I can't tell you how many times I get emails from our students um, that say your class was so well organized or you know I knew sometimes I, I really like I'm like there are no there are no emails in the inbox like are you there are you guys there and it's because I've created this whole system of wherever you want to find information it's there you can go to your classmates you can come to me you can go to the class lounge you can go to all these different places and so having a structure where they really, really know what to do, where to go, how to be successful, what, you're, that, what you expect from them, right? So it helps our students. It differentiates us from correspondence courses. We talked about that, right? We wanna make sure we are providing a framework for successful online courses. I mentioned peer online course review to you guys a bit ago. I am one of the lead reviewers for poker on our campus. And so when we talk about course design, you know, of course we wanna look at what is complying with federal and state regulations, but we're also going to talk about what is the best practice for our students? You know, I definitely as a GE coordinator have to distinguish between what is regulatorily um, required versus what is the best practice. So we're gonna go over what's required by law, but also some things that are best practices. And my recommendation is that even though we have this two out of five that we're gonna be looking at in a moment, maybe you wanna make sure you have at least one of each of the five things, right? And there are many different ways that we can do that because we wanna make sure we're creating really, really successful online courses for our students. Um, yes, do you have a question? Um, yeah, there's some good questions in the chat. Um, yes. If you want to look at them that address what you were talking about. Yeah. So the first one is, um, is the class lounge an open discussion or do we use another setting? Um, and then uh, do you have a minimum of what discussion content should be to earn the extra credit? And then do we need to post or apply in discussions to each student or is a private comment when we grade considered RSI? So we're all really great questions. Those are all really great questions. We're gonna get into the discussion section um, in a moment. So if we could hold these questions until we get there, that would be really great. I will definitely get back to them. Thank you. Those are all excellent questions. Um, we'll capture them for you and make sure that they're, they don't show the screen. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have a whole section about online discussions because I think that is the, it is like literally the, the golden egg of online courses. Um, all right, so now we, we're done with the why, let's move on to the how. This is really, really the framework of, you know, how will it help us? How will we use it? What are we going to do? Um, we mentioned that it improves student engagement, uh, it increases student success, promotes effective online teaching, provides access to federal financial aid. Going back to the idea that this is federally required by Title V and also by the California State Department of Education, um, it is required for financial aid. And in fact, we have audits at our college. I'm not quite sure how this is happening system-wide, but we have audits to ensure RSI um, is happening in our classes and that students are actually participating. Otherwise, they have to return back their financial aid. And so, you know, you definitely want to make sure in the economic climate our students are facing that we're doing the best that we can for them in terms of financial aid. All right, I'm going to try and reduce this so you guys can see this entire screen. Can you see my screen better? Can you see my entire screen? Or is this? I can see your entire screen, Diana. Okay. All right. So this is the framework. And we're going to go over this one by one. It is a lot of information at once. But I want to kind of break it down into two cohorts. The first one is the regular uh, instruction. And then the other one is the substantive component. So we're going to go over a, you have to make sure you're doing two of these five things. And I'm going to go over them individually. So don't worry about looking at all of them all together. But I wanted you to see the entire system together before we broke it down into pieces. So regular in, uh, in substantive communication. I'm sorry, that is a typo. It should be regular, regular and interactive. Uh, communication. I apologize about that. Um, in any case, it includes two of the five of these things. And the first one is direct instruction. Direct instruction, and I'm going to give you examples of each one of these things specifically, and we'll talk about best ways to use them, and I'll show you um, some of them in my class. Uh, so you need to at least do two, is the federal regulation, but best practice is to make sure you're doing at least each of these things in your online courses. So the first one is direct instruction, accessing and commenting on homework. Uh, this could be homework, quizzes, uh, discussions, things like that. Answering students' questions regarding coursework, using discussions in an online classroom, and employing other instructional activities. So this is the group of things that we need to ensure that we're doing and we're going to go over them each individually so we can see what that might look like. So the first one is really pretty simple is direct in instruction, right? We all know that we are the teachers, so we have to kind of teach them something, right? I mean, most of us wouldn't just say go read chapters 1 and 2 in the book and come back and take the test, right? You're going to create some sort of lesson. So when we talk about um, what that looks like. It could be recorded lectures that are assessed through assignment. And not everybody is, you know, camera friendly or likes to make videos. So that ne isn't necessarily the only way. But I like to, when I'm creating my classes, provide multiple formats for students because you have different kind of learners. You have visual learners, you have auditory learners, right? You have different kind of learners. Um, let's see, do we have some more questions? Sorry, I can't kind of see the chat and the slides. Um, so you could do recorded lectures. If you don't like to be seen on camera, you could do voice over PowerPoints. PowerPoints have, you know, technology now where you can literally take a script. And I like to use AI. They have AI that has uh, voices that are 
more human-like. So you can take a PowerPoint that you've written or created for your students and you can write a script and you can have the AI voice narrate the script. You can record the voice yourself over your PowerPoints. You can have a, a presentation where you're talking, your voice is talking, but they're seeing the screen in the PowerPoint. So there are a lot of different ways that we can do this, but the idea is you're giving students who are visual learners something to look at. Um, one thing to note, when you do make lectures or PowerPoints, it's best to keep them under 10 minutes because of the attention span. So it's it's good to make multiple videos or multiple um, choices, uh, 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 PowerPoint lectures, but I can't tell you how many instructors, you know, when, when we teach in person, we will have a two-hour lecture, right? That's part of our class. But you don't want to necessarily do that online. It's not as engaging as it is in the classroom because you can't ask questions. You can't, you know, gauge their interest. So having shorter videos, more multiple videos is probably the better option to go um, with that. Uh, sorry, let's go back up here. So uh, instructor content created content using in, in quizzes. So one of the important things about all of the lecture materials is that we're not just giving them the materials. We're not just, so in corresponding class, classes, they literally can just have videos and you watch the videos and take assessments, right? Take quizzes. Like that's not what we're doing. You're gonna create the content. You're gonna use it in quizzes. You're gonna use it in assignments. You're gonna use it in discussions. You're going to have the students interact with it. So it's not just, I created a lecture, I created a PowerPoint, I gave it to my students, I put it in a module. It's how are you interacting? How are you massaging that information? How are you scaffolding it so that students can actually learn? Um, graded examples of student work with feedback. This is a great way to teach what it is that you're wanting students to do, right? Um, and not just this is an example of the student work, but giving them that feedback that teaches them, oh, this is what they did really well and this is what they did, this is what they need extra work with. Recorded hands-on demonstrations. Sometimes we have classes that are like lab classes or chemistry classes or um, in the pandemic, we even did our um, ceramics class online, right? And so having these recorded hand-on demonstrations where students can actually see what it is that you're doing as you're instructing them. These are all examples of direct exam uh, instruction and they go back to that two out of five. Now, do we have any questions about the instructions before we move on to the next one? Yana, I did see a question in the chat about from Laura Nelson says, my college does not pay for Otter AI anymore, so we're expected to fix the transcript manually. Is there an AI alternative that will do that for us? So for, are you talking about for um, closed captions? Is that what the question is about? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, so I'm glad that you brought that up. Going back to the difference between what's legally required and what is um, best practices, it's actually legally required that if we make videos or PowerPoints that we are providing closed captions. Um, the DEC grant is now available for closed captioning services. So please talk to your campuses. I know there was a... Um, a process by which they were closed, but now they have reopened. So that is one of the avenues, especially if you have an accommodation request. But even if you don't have an accommodation request, you should be making sure that your videos and PowerPoints are closed captioned. So that being said, one of the things that you can do is you can use um, Canvas Studio, you can use uh, even YouTube, you can use whatever medium Zoom that you're using that does automated captions, you can use those and then run them through an AI like ChatGPT. ChatGPT will clean it. So first of all, the, the, the automated, gen, the auto-generated captions are gonna be 85 to 95% correct. 
you need to make sure they're 100% correct. So you're going to take the file that Zoom or Canvas Studio, or we have Yuja on our campus, um, or YouTube makes, you're going to take that file and you're going to put it through an AI, like ChatGPT or another, and you're going to say, clean this up, add you know, periods, uh, make sure things are spelled correctly. Um, and then, so it's going to go from 85 to like 95%. And then you can spend much less time fixing those captions. So we can have a two hour video that we can clean up in 20 to 30 minutes using AI. It's been really, really helpful. Um, so like I said, if you have your videos prepared ahead of time, you can go to the debt grant. You also can, uh, use uh, AI tools to help you in that process. And on our campus, we have professional development around that. So I'm hoping on your campuses, you would have something like that as well. No, they're not accurate. That's the whole point is that you have to clean them up, but you can use AI. They don't even give you uh, uh, punctuation. They don't you know, spell words correctly. You can use AI to clean them up, but then a human still needs to go behind them and make sure they're 100% accurate. So no automated captions are not um, uh, accessible and the AI captions are not accessible either, but using AI will get you that step that much closer. So instead of spending two to four hours on a video, you can just spend 20 minutes. Does that make sense? It looks like it did based on some of the responses in the chat. And there was also a couple of our participants that left in and provided some additional context. We Thank also you. still have some discussion related questions. I just want to make sure that the people that ask those, we didn't forget that, but I believe Deanna, that's in an yeah. upcoming section here. So that's in the upcoming section. Absolutely. Yeah, so so um, Jackie, Megan and Michelle and Alice, we still have your questions reported. Yes. Um, also in terms of, direct instruction. We also can demonstrate real life scenarios of the week's concepts. One of the things I'm a real estate instructor as, as an, in addition to a business instructor. And so I like to tell my students, I can tell you all the theory in the world. If you don't know how to close a deal or, you know, open, create an open house flyer or, you know, write a contract when you graduate, I have done you a disservice, right? You need to be able to graduate out of my program, knowing all the things that you need to do to be a successful real estate agent. And so it's important that you understand that that is a component of direct instruction as well. All right, so the second one is this idea of assessing and commenting on homeworks. Um, so I did mention that I went to Columbia and Columbia definitely has a stage on the stage model of education, right? You turn in your assignment and they give you a comment and you know that's it there there's no there there's that, that that was it right there was no in between there was no having a meeting of the minds there was no process or any of that and so that definitely is an option providing individual feedback on the assignment the student assignment you write your comments in the speed grader you know um, explaining what they did well letting them know what was missing what's important to note here that you using words like good job um, and that's all you're leaving or having comments that are the same for all students, that's not considered individualized feedback. So this would be sort of like, you did a really good job with your assessment of why this business went out of, you know, went bankrupt. You didn't include external forces. So make sure next time you're looking at what they could have done differently, something like that, where you actually are giving specific feedback to assignments. And this can be in the form of written detail comments, but if you're like, uh, or it could be annotated. In SpeedGrader, you have the ability to actually get a pen, and I can show you guys later maybe if we have time, um, and write on the actual papers if you have them submit Word documents and stuff. And I really like that because it allows them to see, especially if you're teaching English or you know communications, oh, right here is where you need to, you know, make more of an emphasis or something like that. But this is really where I like to shine. And it is an audio and video feedback. You know, I spend so much time on the computer writing emails and reading things that I just don't want to type anymore. So Canvas has an amazing function where you can 
literally say what it is that you want in terms of a feedback to the student. Or better yet, you can record a video and you can do that in SpeedGrader or you can do it in Canvas Studio. And I think this is awesome because then the students get a sense of who you are and they really think, they really understand that you care about them and their work. So that's a great, great way to make sure you're providing individualized feedback. Does anybody here use audio or video feedback? And they have um, some testimonies that they can share about how students really uh, enjoy that? Please. Well, I was raising my hand as and I use it. Um, I find it very helpful, especially for papers or when my students submit a lit review because sometimes they really would need to hear from you when they have a, when there's a, so much feedback, having that voice to say, oh, you did a really good job, but I'm noticing there needs to be a lot of work on this and that. And just having that voice connection, I, I noticed they really, really like it and, and um, they benefit from that. And it's also easier for me sometimes than just constantly typing. It's, it's a change of... Um, how I do my work and it's nice to change things up sometimes. So it's a win-win on both sides. It certainly is. And I see somebody put in the chat that they're not um, accessible. Audio uh, feedback cannot be accessible or, or it's possible that it's not accessible. So one of the ways that I deal, I deal with this is that in terms of accessibility, we can provide alternative um, assignments, feedback, discussions, whatever it is for our students, and as long as they're equal. So, of course, we get accommodation notices from students who need accommodations, but not all students fall into that category. They don't all disclose their accommodations. So I like to put a catch-all um, uh, disclaimer in my syllabus that if you need accommodations or you need alternate assignments, or there is something in the course that isn't working for your learning style, please let me know. And so it is perfectly acceptable to, as a guide, give audio feedback to students. And then if you find that there's a student that can't receive that audio feedback, or you know in advance, you can provide them an alternative format that is just as valuable in instruction. So in that case, you could you know, write it out or whatever the case may be. So we have means of addressing that, but I think it's important that we include all of the options for students to make them, um, to make sure they have a more robust experience. All right, any other questions? All right, so what uh, another um, idea of assessing and commenting homework examples include, this is designing and incorporating a scaffolding assignments with which students have the opportunity to revise and uh, resubmit assignments based on feedback. So I mentioned to you guys that um, ancient in ancient times ago, when I first started teaching online, you know, I just was awful at it. I'm just going to be very, very, very honest. and. I just really was very inflexible to the point where, you know, I was that stage on the stage because that's how I was taught, not because I, I was a terrible person, but that was the model that I was given in education all of the years that I had been taught. So this, I did this new equity-based idea of creating assignments where students can revise them, students can improve them. Um, I am in participating at my college in a uh, equity track where we're really focused on how do we give students ownership and the ability to improve their work as they go along. Things like, you know, making sure, you know, they, they're able to improve their grade as their competencies improve. I remember when I was at Columbia, I started English um, and the high school that I came from at the time didn't really have a strong background in language and so I was getting C's um, but by the time I finished the semester I was getting A's but I got to be in the class because they averaged the grade right if you have a student who is really going from C work to A work at the end of the semester you know there has to be some mechanism by which you can capture that and so creating assignments and giving them feedback and giving them the opportunity 
to revise that is definitely a way that we can improve uh, and assess and, and comment on their work. All right, any other questions? Oops, sorry. All right, so next we're gonna go on to, oh, some other ways that we can make sure we are giving examples, creating detailed rubrics. Now, I don't mean to say um, just a rubric that has, you know, oh, 10 points if you're doing a good job with this. There are actual comments that you can put in the rubrics. So once you create the rubric and the rubric says, oh, you get 10 points if you have added um, an area of, you know, external factors, for instance, you can put a comment in that part of the rubric that says you did an uh, outstanding job explaining how these external forces really cause this business to shut down. And so in that way, you're really being able to hone in on what students are doing well. Um, but this is another way that we can meet RSI in our classrooms. Um, oh, somebody put in a comment that they ask if uh, they, pref they prefer written feedback. That's a great idea. Um, the next one is adding comments to quiz questions. This is a really, really great way to make sure students understand what it is they're getting wrong. So a lot of times when they take a quiz, you can review the answers at the end and you can say, yes, you got this right because blah, 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 or no, this is absolutely wrong. And here are the reasons why. That is the way that you have that on time, just in time learning for students. All right, I'm gonna make, how are we doing on time? We are at 11.46 currently, Diana. So okay. about halfway through. Halfway through, okay, that's pretty good. All right, so number three, answering questions regarding uh, coursework examples. So this is another way that this is, we're still in that two out of five framework, right? So we went through number one, which was direct instructions. We went through number two, which was individualized feedback. And now we're on number three, which is answering students' questions regarding coursework examples. Um, and some, some examples of this include uh, communication policies and actions that provide timely feedback. So I wanna show you guys really quickly, now that we have a little bit of time, um, the Canvas class that I mentioned to you. Oh, come on, sorry for that the Canvas class that I mentioned to you. So in this, this is my class and this is my welcome page. I have this video and it's it's actually, like I mentioned, it's an AI video that I created a, um, a script and put it in there because I don't love making big videos of myself. But if we go over to the module section, sorry. Yeah, so if we go over to the module section, um, Sorry, my, my camera was muted. Um, I was asking if you could hear me and nobody was hearing. Um, all right, so in my module, you'll see that there are really important areas here. There's expectations for the students and instructor. I have communication policies on my homepage where they get to learn what they can expect um, in terms of contacting me. Um, this is really, really important how we communicate how do I get my grades and instructor comments? How can I view annotations and feedbacks in my assignments? Where can I ask course related questions? Where's the Zoom information? Like having all of this really laid out for your students is going to really make sure that they understand this idea of um, what I can expect from you as an instructor. I apologize for the noise in the background. Um, regularly set up interview review sessions or office hours where students review course topics. Now, of course, we don't have to have regular meetings, especially if the class is asynchronous, but 
if you do have office hours, and, and I think the most most of us are required to have office hours, making the most of those by setting up review sessions that are optional, maybe recorded um, and closed captioned for students or having drop-in sessions, letting them know that, hey, if you're not able to make our regularly scheduled office hours, you can set up appointments um, for something that works better. This one I really, really like, and it's answering questions in the weekly discussion. So we talked about, or we're going to talk about weekly discussions in a moment. And one of the things when I was in my tenure process is I was just giving students comments in speed grader, right? Because that was my idea of assessing them and giving them feedback. But actually going in the actual discussion while it's live during the week, will help guide the conversation so that students know if they're getting off track or if they're headed in the right direction. So this is a really, really important way that we can cultivate the learning process. So it's sort of like if we were in a classroom and students were going off track or on a tangent, we would sort of like bring them back and refocus them to the points that we're learning. So we wanna kind of do the same thing with our weekly discussions. Answering students, we talked about this, their questions about course content in a timely fashion, facilitating weekly lounges. So I talked about my class lounge, which is one lounge for the entire semester. I have seen instructors have weekly discussions where students can come in and ask each other about the work. And this is really important um, for you to come in and kind of, like I said, make sure you're guiding that conversation to make sure students are not off track, but it is definitely a way for them to learn from each other and to kind of make sure that they're learning in the way that you want them to learn. So any questions about number three, which is making sure we're answering students' questions regarding course, uh, coursework. Nope. I'm not seeing any specific ones to that in the chat, although I do just want to address that one question came up was having a copy of the PowerPoint. We do have a we do plan to have the slides from today's webinar up on our site. Thank you. All right. So this is the meat and the potatoes. Remember, I'm a meat and potato girl. Um, so using discussions in online classes. Now, this is really, really where I think the magic happens in classrooms. If you can get your classroom discussions to come alive. It is where students share, I love for students to share their life experience, their work experience around the topics that we're talking about in class. I love for them to critique each other's work. I love for them to be able to um, just really make the, the work come alive and, and, and take on the form that they're going to be able to use it. So one of the ways that I do this is I have a um, course introduction. Um, let's see if I can pull it up here. We use Harmonize at West LA College, and it is amazing. Um, so for those of you who don't have Harmonize, it would definitely is something that you should look into. But what I love about it is that it allows for discussions, and the discussions become like tiles. So if you look at, this is the, the Harmonize interface. If you look at the discussion, oh, I don't have to authorize it, sorry about that. Um, if you look at the discussion, it becomes little tiles, kind of sort of like they use in Discord or social media. So as you see, I've posted my first, so here's my prompt. It's like, here's a fun introduction. Tell me about yourself, meet your classmates. And I've posted a fun little video here about myself and each one of their posts will be, a tile and then they get to comment or annotate on the post the in it's just really really great because they can leave videos they can leave and it becomes more like social media it makes it more socially interactive um if you don't have harmonized uh we do still have uh new discussions in canvas coming i think that brings a little bit more interactivity but making sure you have these course introductions and you respond to each student when they're first coming into the class. Um, I like to kind of give a prize to the first person who 
you know, showed up, hey, you're the first person who posts, you get an extra five points um, or whatever the case may be, just to kind of get that momentum. Because if, if students see you're absent the first two weeks, they tend to not be engaged. But if you can kind of capture them in those first couple minutes, that will really, really, really keep them engaged. So I love to do that at the beginning of the course. A next idea is participating in weekly discussions that probe challenging concepts in the week's material. Um, going back again to harmonize, and this is not a harmonized webinar, but I really, really love to use it. Sorry, that's, I really, really love to use it. Um, and it does have this component of AI where it will use Bloom's taxology to help you scaffold your discussion so that you can have level one all the way up to, you know, something more robust, like creating new material. And so um, making sure you're creating these discussions that are focused on the, the really, really challenging topics. So for instance, in my real estate finance course, where we will talk about um, qualifying a student, for my discussion, I might say something like, when, when, when homeowners go to get loans, they, they are actually charged more if they have bad credit, right? But then it keeps them in this perpetual situation where they never have enough money because they pay more for everything. So from an industry point of view, that seems to make sense because they're more of a risk, but from an ethical point of view or from humanity, humanitarian point of view, you know, how do you feel about this? Just kind of getting them to a place where they understand and they start to think about like, oh, wait, what, 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 how could I change that if I wanted to, or if I was able to, how would I change it? Um, so making sure you're picking out topics that really probe that week's material. One of my favorite um, discussions is in my accounting module in my business class where we talk about accounting and I will talk about Black Friday because students don't realize that Black Friday literally came about because that was when retailers were their books were in the black that was when they finally were making money and so because they were finally making money it was like oh everything that happened after this point in the year is just gravy so we can you know, put sales on so we make as much money as possible. So what is, what is, what is how, does, how does that make you feel about Black Friday? How does that change the way that you think about, you know, these sales? If it was just a marketing ploy or, you know, it was just made for profitability. So having these types of discussions that really highlight what it is that you want the student to take out into the real world. We talked about the uh, Q&A forum or the class lounge. Um, I also like this providing weekly announcements. When I took my class through poker, one of the things that we have to do in the announcements or the welcome to the week um, is really talk about what is engaging about that material and how they're going to use it in their career, right? So it's like, oh, this week we're learning about, you know, um, uh, interact, uh, uh, interactive design. In, in, our, in my web design courses. Why is it that we care about this? Well, most websites are interactive today. And if you don't know how to make interactive websites, no one's gonna hire you. Oh, then students kind of get that little light bulb moment. I really need to pay attention to this content. I need to pay attention to the concept. Um, so making sure we're having weekly announcements, but the weekly announcements, they are specifically about the course content and they're giving, they're highlighting those areas that kind of make sense to, to pull out the information. Um, and then curating videos with guiding questions about for students to answer. So in my discussions, I will often put two, one or two videos and I will tell them, watch this video about this controversial topic and tell me what you think. What is your perspective? What is your argument? So that is another way. Now let's go back to some of the questions we had about discussions. So someone asked what was the a proper length of time, right, for a discussion. Because we want it to still be regular, regular and uh, substantial, I'm um, sorry, regular and interactive, we're going to say for a 16-week course, it should at least be weekly. Sorry, we're going to say for a 16 week course, it should be weekly. Um, and 
we want to say for a eight week course, you want to also have it be weekly. But if you're having a five week course, it might need to be two times a week, right? Because you're still doing the same amount of content. Um, can we see the discussion questions? I want to make sure I hit them before we move on. Yes, I do have the discussion questions that were asked earlier, Diana. Yeah. Yes. So I'll go in order that they popped up. So Jackie, a little earlier in the webinar, asked regarding the class, it's a specific to the class lounge, what method do you use to determine how many points to give for extra credit? So I just say one point per post up to 10 points. I used to, when I was green, I used to say one point per post and I would get students with like 49 points because they were talking about you know what they have for breakfast and the best place to get bagels and so I kind of streamline that you get 10 points maximum it has to be on content so you can't just talk about you know bananas and apples um and so then I put a little disclaimer as well about it has to be at the instructor's discretion just mm -hmm. so that we're all on the same page but that's a great question. A follow-up to that one, just for the crowd in general, is do you set an end date for that one? So is it all the way up until the last day of the semester or is does it end by a certain point? That's a great question. I actually end it the week before finals start. Mm -hmm. So when finals open, I end it because there's literally no content that we're discussing. So now you're just trying to pad your grade. And I want this to be an experience that's useful throughout the semester, not just something that you're using to pad your grade. So I do close it right before the finals open. In some ways, and that sounds like it goes within the RSI guidelines about it being timely and time specific. Exactly. The second one was from Megan Tori Payne. Is the, is the class lounge an open discussion or do you use another setting? So what's interesting is in our poker um template because we have a template that we've created for faculty who go through poker they have both a class lounge and they have a q a lounge so mm -hmm. one is specifically for content around the class and then one is just where students can hang out and just chat about i don't know whatever they're watching on netflix um so it depends on which one of those you're you're um you're talking about but for the class lounges i you know will make them really specific, just guided with the content, specific points, making sure you're on, you know, task. Does that answer the question? Megan, I don't know if you're still here, but did that answer your question? She says, yes, thank you. The next question is from Michelle Laveau. My apologies if I mispronounced the last name. And her question is, do you have a minimum of what the discussion content should be to earn the extra credit? And I believe your uh, previous response uh, alluded to that, Diana. Yes. So for my discussions, let's see if I can send them, show them really quickly to you and in, in, in harmonize. Um, my discussions, they are, you have to have. And I, I give you all the instructions. Like you need to post three times on two different days. Your first post is due on Thursday. Your second and third posts are due on Sunday. You can only get full credit if you follow all of these instructions. Your first post has to be 300 points. And your responses to your classmates have to be a minimum of 100 points. That's just the framework. You still have to answer the questions. You still have to give me, you know, you can't just be like, oh, great job, you know. I love how you, you know, your language is, is so flowy. Like, no, you need to get into the meat and potatoes. But this is sort of like the framework that I that I give students. Because what I find is that if you don't give them a framework, then your um, your responses are all over the place. Some people will give you, you know, great job. Some people will give you, you know, a whole book that's more akin to an assignment as opposed to a discussion. So I used to do 200 posts. I, I, the reason I do 300 specifically is because Harmonize will check AI. Harmonize uses Turnitin, um, but it will check AI for 300, po for posts that are over 300. So that's kind of the guidelines that I use, but I definitely, uh, sure, re-listen. Sure, 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 sure. So, um, and I have the instructions here. 
Um, but for my general discussions, I require that they post three times on two different days. And the reason that I do this is that if I just had it due on Sunday, everybody would come in at 11 o'clock on Sunday, there'd be nobody to respond to post. So it just kind of muddles it. So I make the first discussion, the main discussion post due by what, uh, Thursday of that week. All of my assignments open Sunday, uh, Monday at 12 o'clock. So they're due on, um, on uh, the first post is due on Thursday. It is 300 words. You have to address the specific question that I'm asking for that week. And then you get to respond to two of your classmates. Um, and the two classmates posts are due on Sunday and those have to be a hundred words. And like I said, this is just me. I've been teaching for, you know, 12 years online now. And so this is kind of what I've come to in terms of making it substantial um, in, in, in getting across what, what I want, but you can tailor it to whatever you'd like. So they have to respond to at least two classmates um, and two different times. And because we use Harmonize, Harmonize is really cool and I won't take too much time to show that, but it kind of gives you all of these metrics about posts and comments. And like I said, they can comment on each other's posts and it just is really, really awesome, but I'm not gonna spend too much time there because uh, I'm not a sales person for Harmonize. But you can use, uh, like I said, Canvas also is coming out with uh, new Canvas discussions, which I think we need to transition to over in the next year or so. So there's a little bit more interactivity there, but really just giving them guidelines and making sure that they're using discussions as a learning tool. All right, any other questions on discussions before we move on? Yes. Ellis mm -hmm. had a question uh, earlier in the webinar. Do we need to post a reply to discussions to each student or is a private comment we grade considered RSI? So that is a great question. That goes back to the difference between what is required and a best practice. So if you're counting the individualized feedback to your students, and this is one of the two of five for you, um, yes, you would be giving them feedback in the speed grader specific to their submission. You did a really great job explaining how, you know, this company is marketing its products well. You missed, you know, maybe, you know, one or two topics, right? So that's individualized feedback. Um, also, in, a, in terms of a best practices, a best practice would be in the middle of the week, if you know your posts are due by Thursday, maybe you go into your class Thursday evening or maybe even Friday morning and kind of see where the conversations are going. If they're headed in the wrong direction or they're doing a really good job, sometimes I like to pose you know, more um, sophisticated questions. Oh, you guys really have got this down pat. What do you think about this wrinkle or how, wh what if we look at it in this way? So this way you're actually curating the conversation and the discussion. Um, and, and so I like to do it that way, but either or would count as your number one, but both the best practice would be both. Does that answer your question? Ellis says, thank you for the answer. And I am being mindful of time. So there's one more question that okay. I believe Lana had. I don't know if yes. I pronounced the name correctly, but how do you make sure that students are responding to discussions in a meaningful way? And how do you make sure that they are not using AI to answer questions? I hear students are doing this. So that's why I like to use Harmonize because Harmonize actually uses Turnitin for plagiarism and it does AI detection. So it's not perfect because no AI is but it will get you to a place where you can open up the conversation with your students about whether or not um, they are using AI. And, and, and there have been instances where the AI checkers say, oh, you know, this is not, this has, this is AI and it's not. Um, and you can just have a conversation with your students. Oh, please walk me through your, your learning process or how did you gather the information or what was the process that you took to kind of get to your finalized project? That literally is a telltale sign of whether they use AI or not, right? Because once you're learning and, and you're formulating things, you can recount that process. And if, if you just copied and pasted, you can't. 
So um, I like to use Harmonize. And, and one other thing is that I do think that they provide uh, free trials for, for schools, but that's the tool that I use. Alternatively, I think with Turnitin, you can contact your DL coordinator. Um, they can have external accounts. And so sometimes we have our faculty copy and paste the discussions and put them into Turnitin outside of Canvas because the discussions don't go through Turnitin in Canvas. Um, or there are some other online AI checkers that faculty are using, but that's sort of the recommendation now. And I do believe there are some challenges with some of the AI detectors that are not perfect, yes. as my understanding of those. And there's been a, there's been some debate around those. Right. And so I my my best practice with that is if you have a student who has a high AI or, or plagiarism, I always invite them into a conversation about the score so that we can kind of clear up. I will say something like, oh, you know, I noticed that you, you were flagged in your assignment. I'd like to have a meeting to discuss your work so that we can clear up any confusion. And in that meeting, I simply will be like, okay, can you walk me through the process for your research or your documentation or whatever it is? And it, it becomes really apparent. And sometimes students will be like, yes, I cheated, I'll do it over. Um, and sometimes, you know, they'll fight you. But if they can have a conversation about the process, you know, I kind of will take them at their word. All right. And I just want right. to let people know that we do have some webinars on the calendar regarding AI. So if you have more specific questions about that, that will be later in the semester. All right. So we're going to move on to number five. This is uh, another one of the two of five things, and this is employing instructional activities outside of the ones that we've already talked about. So this could be like hosting office hours at a recurring time each week, sharing weekly summaries or highlights of discussion posts. One of the things that I like to do in my discussions is after the discussions have been submitted, um, or even when I am, I have my, my real estate students complete forms, um, I will post the completed accurate form so that they see what the what a good version looks like and they they can check to see where they've made their mistakes. So, you know, sharing these weekly summary, summaries or highlights of discussion posts can be really helpful to make sure that we're all collectively understanding the same things, um, providing hands-on demonstrations for online courses, taking field trips, if that, you know, uh, applies for online courses. We do have some online courses where we have field trips that are in um, included or some sort of field work. These are all outside of extra, our normal instructional activities. And they could be specific to your discipline. So for instance, if you are teaching a theater online course, having a student go to a recital, right, would be an appropriate other instructional activity. Does anybody have any examples of using these types of other instructional activities in their classrooms and how the level of depth of, of knowledge that it brings to their class that they can share? You can also place your response in the chat. We also did have a question coming up, come up regarding option number five from Mary that says, do Regarding option five, do these need to be written and approved by your campus or are they at the discretion of the instructor? So for our college and our curriculum committee, in order for us to do field work for online courses, it needed to be in the course outline of record. So I would say check with your local campuses and your curriculum. Um, so it, it it could depend by campus, but for us, it, it needed to actually be listed in the course outline of record. Uh, a comment Nancy brings up that we do virtual museum trips and they really help because as a low socioeconomic area, it is sometimes the only way they can complete the assignment. Yes, that's a great idea. And that's another idea is that even if you can find ways to lend your discipline to virtual hands-on materials, so for instance, in real estate, how they have virtual open houses, Right. If you can do something like that, it will be important for students 
to kind of, oh, this is what it looks like in the real world. Um, so yes, any kind of field work that is based on course content, if it's going to be outside of the classroom, it may need to be in the COR, but it could be virtually and that could be very helpful. Um, and then the last one is adding the RSI communication plan that I showed you before in your orientation module. I think if you spell it out for students, if you let them know, this is what I expect from you, and this is what you can expect from me. If you do have those edit auditors, I mentioned before that we have the Department of Education auditors come into our online courses and audit our courses. You literally can take them to, this is the communication plan. This is where I explain to students they're going to be get their answers, uh, their feedback from their assessments within a week. This is where I explain to them I'm going to respond to them within 48 hours. This is where I explain to them where they can go get additional help if they need, um, if they have additional questions. One assignment is... Uh, so that's a great one. In the child development, they have to do observations, but that's written in your course op uh, COR, isn't it? The course op observations. I do believe that is written in there. All right, so let's move on. So that was A. Let's recap. We had five sections. We have direct instruction. We have assessing students. We have, um, come on. You guys, tell me. But let's see how good your memory is. What are the five that we've covered so far? Direct instruction. What was number two? You can also feel free to unmute yourself and share. Assessing and commanding on homework. Assessing Examples. homework, yes. Yep. Number three. Answering student questions, number four. The meat and potatoes. Discussions, one. discussions. Discussions, yes. And then number five. I was um I thought did we talk about other other, other activities, examples? other instructional activities. Yes. And so the reason I do this in my classes is because you need to hear new content at least 11 to 13 times before it becomes in your head stuck. So I will have them repeat that information over and over again. I want you guys to be able to call to mind what are the two of the five things that I need to do for RSI. All right. So that was A, if you remember. We had A and we had B. B was making sure that we have regular substantive uh, communication, right? And so in order to meet the criteria for this, we have to do two things. We have to pro provide consistent interactions based on the course meaning at least weekly for full time and more for shorter classes. And we have to engage with students by answering their questions on a timely basis. I do believe we've reviewed this, but just to kind of give you examples of what that looks like, it would be um, weekly for semester classes, two or more times a week for short-term classes. And that means that if you're using discussions, you're gonna have a discussion once a week. If you're using announcements, you're gonna have announcements once a week. If you're using announcements for short-term classes, you'll have it twice a week. Um, so whatever mode or method that you're using, you would have the mode um, that matches with the length of the course. Responding on a timely basis to their inquiries, to their questions, um, to even their assignments. I cannot tell you how many instructors will wait till the end of the semester to grade all of the content. That is not RSI. That is not RSI. That is not RSI. And and what what's more, when we talk about best practices for our students, you can't get from that C student to that A student without giving them that feedback. The only reason why I was able to increase my knowledge was that I actually learned and was assessed and could see what I was doing wrong and could rewrite it, right? So that process took me from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. If you're waiting until the end of the semester to grade all of your content, then students can't correct what they're doing wrong and they're just going to be resubmitting that all the way along. And so you want to make sure you're letting them know they, when they can expect um, assignments from you. My guideline is within the next week of when you turned it in, I will be giving you that assignment. So if you turned that assignment in on Sunday, you can expect by next Sunday that assignment will be graded within that week. 
Um, and I think that's a fair or reasonable expectation. Of course, these are all guidelines. You can change them and make them your own. Um, but it's really, really important that you are making sure you're responding to students in a timely manner. Yes, for, for a full semester, you wanna have at least one discussion and one announcement per week. And like I said, the really nice thing about RSI is that it's a framework. You can mix and match. There are two, five categories and you need to do two of them. And within the two categories, there are lots of different ways that you can make it. So you can mix and match. You can do four things under direct instruction or one thing. You know, you can do two things in assessment. Like it just really is just the framework so that we are making sure we're meeting the federal guidelines. All right, so now it's time for us to review. Do we understand what RSI is and what it means? Can someone explain it to me? I like to use this analogy. I tell my students, explain it to me like you were explaining it to your five-year-old cousin. Who wants to explain it for me? What is RSI and how do, what does it mean? RSI is regular substantive interaction. And what that means, in my view, in my opinion, is when you are providing quality, effective, productive, relevant, <laughs> engaging feedback to a student that provides um, details other than just great job on a regular basis. There you go. On a regular basis. There you go. That was that was the money point. Absolutely. You get a star. All right. Three times so a week. It, <laughs> yeah. Whatever it is, it's regular. I can it's predictable. I can expect it. So what are some of the most important takeaways that you guys have come up with that you can practice in your course? I've given you, you know, 20 different things that you can do, but which ones can you implement in your course tomorrow? Anybody want to share? For me, um, creating a class lounge, like we always do a weekly discussion um, that I do extra credit points that has a cutoff, but having something that's just available for them to interact with each other and with me was something I really responded to. Awesome. Anybody else? Uh, so I'm just looking at some of the comments in the chat. Uh, we have curating the discussion, shifting the conversation or deepening it, creating a more clear communication plan. And I'm strongly considering breaking down my lecture slides into mini lecture videos with audio. Regarding the first bullet point, I also want to acknowledge a few of the responses there in terms of definitions of RSI, regular frequent interaction between instructor and student and student to student, in addition to it being content driven, so frequent, regular. And communication between instructor and student, 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 both faculty and student initiated is what one person has. And ongoing theme, consistent, meaningful interaction with your students. Wow. Can you guys all come work for West LA? Can you all be my teachers? <laughs> you make my job so easy. Thank you. That is amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All right. So the next thing is I want to reflect. I want you to ask, what do I need to learn more about? I really wanted to make this um, a hands-on what you could really use today. Obviously, there's a lot more legal ease behind RSI. There's a lot more that we can consider. There's a lot of many different ways that we can use it. So what is it that you need to learn more about? And, and come back to your campuses and find out where can you get that information? How can you get these conversations started? Um, and what are the next steps that you need to do to bring RSI to your classes? What is your RSI plan gonna look like? Anybody wanna share? I think to provide a professional development workshop to what you provided more frequently, I think would be very helpful. It also looks like someone said, I'm going to get help using Harmonize for discussions. Yes, Harmonize is amazing. 
um, so I I started as a distance education coordinator about a year and a half year ago, and um, I've been doing seminars. But one of the things that faculty really want are um, examples, you know, case case cases of how they can use it in their discipline. So based on your um, presentation, it was wonderful, by the way. Um, I only wish I could I could get this much engagement, but. Um, I'm thinking we maybe uh, do something discipline specific, get, do the same RSI discussion, but have it by division or by discipline so we can share. So I'm not teach math, math, so I can I can give them, I can suggest examples in math, but I am not that familiar in other disciplines. So I love that. And you know what's really cool about that is that it can go out in your division meeting. Because, you know, we teach, we have like a five minute time uh, uh, attention span. So, you know, just give me five topics, five highlights, five things I can do in my math class right now, you know, in your division meeting, and it will go so very far. So I love that idea. Thank you. I like that five minutes. <laughs> I'm going to try that. <laughs> <laughs> five things in five minutes is my mantra. Five things in five minutes. All right. Anything else? Well, this has been amazing. I'm so encouraged that you all are so interested and wanting to um, not only comply with federal law, but help our students, right? Like do all of the things that we need to do to be the best teachers that we are. So I wanted to give everybody my contact information. I'm happy to share with you, um, you know, if there's a page or a module that you want me to share, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I think I may have some things in the comments. They're kind of old. I can update it to make it a little bit more recent. But if I can be of any help, please contact me either by email or by my phone. Any other questions before we go? Were, were there any burning questions from the beginning of the uh, webinar that you guys didn't get answered that you absolutely have to have answered now? No. It's like a lot of praise. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you all. I'm going to give you back four minutes of your day. I really appreciate the time that you spent today. And I know your students appreciate it as well. And I just have a few items in closing. So as Diana said, thank you very much for attending this webinar and giving her your undivided attention for an hour and a half. So once again, if you haven't completed the survey, please look to the chat and we will drop that in the chat one more time. So again, it's set up to allow you to receive a copy of your responses. There's just a little tab. You have the check at the bottom, which can serve as verification of your attendance. If you do have any sort of issues, please contact support at cbc.edu. We also hope that you register for some of our other webinars that we'll be offering through the term. We'll also drop a link into the chat to showcase our upcoming programming. And lastly, we will be working on getting the associated slides up on our site, as well as a recording of the webinar. But as was noted throughout this webinar, we do want to make sure that it is accessible and properly captioned. So bear with us on that one. Thank you all again, and please have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll stop the recording here. Will there be a link provided uh, where we can find the slides on your website?